For more, we are joined by Gamco Investors Chairman, Founder, and CEO, and Institutional Investors Money Manager of the Year, named that just recently, Mary Gabelli with us. Delighted to be here. And of course, Nick and John with us. And I'm laughing because I know I'm sitting next to a Yankees fan. <laughs> That's uh, what happens when you grow up in the Bronx and you have passion for sports. Uh, but money managers have been very successful in some of the uh, acquisitions they made. Look at the Red Sox. Right. Look at uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning. With, Why don't you uh, buy the Mets, though? Uh, we, uh, the economic transaction also should include the uh, sports network, the SNY. And so if you buy the Yankees, as you would like to do, the Yes Network should be part of that package. And th they split that off, and that's where the economics are. It's like Madison Square Garden. It's not in owning the Knicks right. and the Rangers. It's owning the MSG Network, number one and two. And we are large shareholders of MSG. We'd rather be passive. But the, it's an easy story to check. All you do is call the Baseball Commission. You have to be approved. And it's a fairly interesting process. Mm. Well, sounds like you thought a lot about it. <laughs> However, Mario, would you be buying into these tech IPOs? Uh, we are tend to buy what is, not what will be. So the social networks are not necessarily our sweet spot. Uh, using a baseball analogy, mm. we like to wait for a high inside pitch, knowing that it's coming, and we'll just stand at the plate all the time. We don't have to swing at everything. On the other side, uh, certain companies like Microsoft have gotten statistically cheap. And uh, clearly, he has a tailwind of good valuation behind him in looking at his investment. That is Einhorn's investment. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, value players have come out, uh, you know, on our program and said Microsoft's a good buy. It's cheap right now. But Einhorn's saying that Balmer is the biggest drag on the stock. I, mean, I, I don't have a point of view on that. I, I haven't read Paul Allen's book. And I would say he has probably a better insight into the dynamics there. I would go back to what Dom Chu said, which is that Steve Ballmer is the second largest shareholder behind Bill Gates with 333 million shares of Microsoft. I actually mm -hmm. spoke to one former tech CEO this morning who said, if Ballmer's going to go, it's going to be because Bill Gates forces him to do it. Well, maybe he wants him. to do it on his own. I mean, he's got $8 billion of economic value there. By, you know, tw if the numbers are right, you multiply it by $25. That's not a shabby in return on his investment. But this is, a big, this is a big issue, not only with a company like Microsoft. I mean, you can think of a dozen technology companies who have had CEOs for a long time who are going through a big shift right now and don't necessarily have a successor that you can think off the bat, right? Well, I was thinking about Bomber. If he really is self-aware and he does think he is the biggest drain on the stock, then the fact that he owns all the stock should be more reason for him to leave, to keep his value. I mean, it is true that since he's taken over, the company has been entire, entirely flat. But would you, I mean, it, but you see it as good value. You think it's a good buy. The stock is statistically cheap. What does that mean, statistically cheap? In other cheap? words, you look at the numbers, you look at the math, you look at the cash flow, you look at the earnings, you look at the dividend power, you look at the, the proprietary position they have in certain areas, Okay. and uh, you come to the conclusion that it's not expensive. Okay, but Mary, let me get back to the other, to, to, to the other area of the technology, the social networking side. I'm not sure. Uh, let me get that clear answer. Would you buy into a LinkedIn? Would you buy into a Zynga when IPOs or a Facebook? No, we like to buy companies that are ignored and unloved. So, for example, which companies can also be taken over and what are the valuations? And, for example, one of our analysts uh, went out to, uh, to three of them. Actually, were at the Boeing conference the other day, uh, yesterday and just arrived back. Uh, another one went to uh, Yahoo and is taking the red eye back. And so we are looking at companies where there is a potential of a financial transaction. Well, speaking to people who work for Mario, Larry Haverty came on with yes. Tom Keen recently and described the LinkedIn process, the IPO hoopla, as a sideshow. Well, Larry is speaking for himself. Yes, but he does think that not only is this not a good investment for Gamco, his concern is that that stock could be going down to something like 30 bucks, 35 uh, Larry bucks. speaking for himself, not for the network. But do you think these valuations are out of whack? Uh, I was there in 1999, and sometimes the momentum continues. There are momentum uh, investors that buy certain se securities. The float on LinkedIn is not high. Uh, so within that framework, one has to look at growth rate, other dynamics, and obviously uh, what happens to companies that are out there, like the Googles of the world, right. like the uh, companies like Microsoft, uh, and then you look at the electronic arts and the take-twos of the world. It's a different world. We tend to buy companies that sell products that benefit from aging of the demographic aging, not right. only the human population, like knees and hips, but things like airplanes. Yep. Barges, and cars, trucks. Cars and parts. And things that we don't think about. For example, the avionic system that controls the airports in the United States are probably 60 years old. We have to redo that. We have to go back to basics. 
Mario. Gabelli. Uh, another personality I want to talk about is John Malone. Gamco, which is Gabelli's firm, uh, owns 1.7 million shares of Liberty Media. That's worth about $152 million. Uh, that is a 2% stake in this company. The reason why I want to talk about Malone is he made some news uh, earlier. Was it last week? Was it that he is in the bidding for Barnes & Noble? Do you understand that move? Well, we're, we're analyzing that now. We obviously have been fans of Lenny Reggio for a long time. We don't own a lot of uh, Barnes & Noble stock, uh, maybe 150,000 shares. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, why did Ergen go after Blockbuster? What does Malone see? Is it trying to create and duplicate what Amazon is doing using the electronic uh, nook to a device, uh, yeah. as a device, as a platform for some dynamic? And it's a work in progress for us to understand it more fully. The best use of the cash there, you think? A billion dollars? Uh, it's not a large number. Uh, what is, uh, for example, uh, there's a story out of Australia that uh, Liberty Global, which is another one of the Malone mm -hmm. Dynamics, uh, uh, has been attempting to sell that. There are buyers for it. That gives them a billion dollars. What we know about John is that he's a wealth builder. He uh, clearly, uh, with Greg Maffei on board, uh, has looked at a lot of alternatives. He's very tax sensitive. He's a wealth creator and uh, clearly a, a move that we always watch. Well, well I was going to say, we, we know a, a, another personality that's huge in this right now is Ron Burkle, who's the second biggest shareholder in Barnes & Noble right after Len Riggio, right? 20% stake here. How much of a, a, a monkey wrench can he throw in the works in this whole deal here? Uh, you know, look, what's the deal that Malone wants? He doesn't necessarily need Burkle. Okay, Burkle got on a ship and he's going to monetize it. That's one aspect. He's not there to run it. Uh, clearly, uh, Reggio is the merchandiser of uh, last resort in this area. He's got a good handle on that pulse. And uh, John wants them to be part of the ownership, and uh, both in terms of management as well as an equity participant. So we'll watch it as we're playing it out. Mary, you mentioned another very interesting name in media, Charlie Ergen. Uh, you guys are a shareholder in DirecTV, as is Malone. And some people wonder if Dish and DirecTV might come together at some point. I spoke to Joe Clayton, the new CEO of Dish, last week, and he did not pour cold water on the idea. He said, we're looking at anything that would be good for shareholders. As a shareholder, do you think that would be a good move to see DirecTV and Dish come together? Well, there's 110 million households in the United States, and DirecTV under Michael White has done a terrific job. They shrunk the cap. Uh, clearly, what you saw with uh, Mel Carmazan on Sirius, he merged two satellite companies uh, trying to get a good handle on that business. The stock has gone from like 70 cents to $2.10. And John Malone backed into that uh, and did a, a very good wealth creation opportunity. And Mel is very gifted. Uh, now, in looking at the number of TV, uh, direct TV households, uh, I think they're like 30 million. Uh, direct TV has 20 uh, and uh, Ergen has 10 in DISH. Uh, both stocks are not expensive, and in addition to that, there's a crown jewel in DirecTV, which is their Latin American operation. So we're, we're an owner of DirecTV and we're an owner of DISH. Okay. Whether they merge together, the dream at one right. point in time was to sell it to AT&T. Uh, okay. When you were watching what Jack Lee was saying, you were shaking your head. Well, I think there's a, clearly a feeling about what direction is this country going in and how do the voters feel about that direction, and that is a very clear indication of how they're going to vote come November of 2012. And right now, the polls are saying we just had someone, uh, Frank Farenkopf, talk about that to our mutual fund directors yesterday, that the uh, polls are saying the country is very concerned about the direction uh, the, the voters are, are where we're going. On the other side of the coin, we know that you have to, uh, you have 51% of the American voters that don't pay any taxes other than Social Security and, and households. And, so clearly, uh, we have to uh, blend the two. If I'm retiring in 10 years, uh, what's going to be my, my, uh, my cushion? Where am I going? And uh, we need to address those issues. I, I like and interest rates coming down. But you're for entitlement reform. Interest rates coming down reduces the discount rate on pensions, which means the liabilities are going up sharply. And the Fed is aware of that and everyone's aware of that. So bottom line, we need to reform Well, you need to do something. Medicare. You need to do something with regards to you can't keep kicking the can down the road. The U.S. deficit is a major issue with regards to uh, our position in the global economy. There was a scene on a television show the other night on HBO that showed the Prime Minister of China sitting next to the President of the United States and saying, you know, the Russians called us and saying, let's screw, uh, uh, damage uh, you on, uh, with regards to your debt. <laughs> 
You can say that word, I think. No, I, no, I, I, I don't know. I was know. saying Never fiddle. <laughs> I said fiddle. Yeah. What were you going to say? Oh, just that business can do its part, too. And just to go back to something that Larry Haverty, who works for Mario, said recently, which is you can say what you want about the LinkedIn IPO, but the fact that there's all that success in Silicon Valley means there's more tax money coming from that part of the country, which is probably a good thing for the economy overall. Okay. It, look, there's been this whole debate over what to do about Alipay, that part of Alibaba. Yahoo owns a stake in Alibaba, mm -hmm. which seems to have slipped away from the company. One of the takeaways from their investor meeting yesterday was talk Stocks are going fairly well. We're figuring out what we deserve in terms of pay, and it seems like investors who have been punishing that stock are feeling a little better about the story. Right, and I, you own Yahoo, Mario. Yeah, in certain of our client accounts, and in part because of Larry Harrity's dynamics, uh, we are looking at the pieces, and clearly uh, that was a surprise with what Jack Ma did. But there's negotiations going on. We'll see how that settles, and I think the outcome will be more of a positive surprise than a negative surprise because the negatives are already in the stock. It, it seems like you know what we've seen the selling we've seen lately is is what a pause that refreshes was your phrase. Well, I, I, there's no question that you have a convergence of dynamics. China keeps the foot on the brake with regards to monetary policy. Uh, the J Japanese issue is very significant. Uh, for example, automobile production in the United States is, was planned at 3.5 million before Fukushima. It's now down to 3 million. Yeah. But that comes roaring back in the second half of the year. There's a pent-up demand for, for cars. Uh, and right now, the statistical data that will come out in June for car sales are going to reflect the lack of supply, the higher pricing. And so, in addition to that, these floods in the in, in the Mississippi uh, 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 River Valley, uh, down in uh, Louisiana, will have an impact on agriculture and uh, lots of things going on. And I, I think that's why you're seeing some people hold what are seen as more defensive stocks like mm -hmm. healthcare, but there's still those who are eager to get into anything tied to the global economy, like Freeport, McMahon, any of these copper stocks, as soon as you hear something encouraging once again. But well, I, at some point in time, the Chinese will step on, will take the foot off the brake and step on the accelerator. The Japanese issue will be behind them. And at that point in time, hopefully we'll get some c more clarity, which may or may not happen with regards to how Merkel and Sarkozy handle the movement of the debt off uh, those countries. But there will always be other issues. There's always what I call not a wall of worry, but a world of worry that we as market participants. But every time we look at a stock specific, El Paso, the, the pipeline company announced financial engineering. The stock has lifted. Uh, that is an example of financial engineering at, at, at work. We'll see more acquisitions uh, announced that underscore that the corporate worlds will be buying companies. Right. Because well, we got a lot of cash, obviously, on the on, Well, on they also want to grow. And they have, to, to some degree, uh, continuing confidence about the future outlook. Uh, Mario, thank you so much for staying with us.